Değerli bilim insanları, değerli öğretim üyeleri, sevgili öğrenciler, sevgili gençler, sevgili arkadaşlar ve değerli dostlar. Bizi TÜBİTAK'ın tüm sosyal medya platformları üzerinden izleyen bilgisever, bilim dostu, güzel insanlar. Epey bir aradan sonra yaz dönemini geride bırakarak TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü'nün Bilimsel Türkiye Popüler Konuşmalar serisi kapsamında yeniden bir araya gelmiş bulunmaktayız. Bu vesileyle hepinizi büyük bir mutluluk ve heyecanla, duyduğum özlemle, saygı ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Ayrıca herkesin yeni eğitim öğretim yılını gönülden kutluyor, engin ve anlamlı başarılarla dolu geçmesini diliyorum. Sevimlerimiz İngilizce gerçekleştirilecektir. Bu nedenle İngilizce konuşmak zorundayım. Dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, dear faculties and students, a very warm hello everyone. Today is spectacular day. As leaving the summer season behind, we continue the online scientific Turkey public lecture series of TÜBİTAK Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, which were organized for national and international audiences. We organize this lecture series with the aim of sharing the passion for science, the power and wonder of science with a wide audience. We organize this lecture series relying on the unifying feature of science for humanity with the participation of distinguished scientists and great speakers of the world. Finally, we organize this lecture series to minimize the negative impacts of COVID-19 situation in the world on scientific souls and science-based actions. It is now my sincere pleasure to welcome all of you for today's wonderful episode of this lecture series. And yet let you know that we have a great speaker, Professor David Weinland, Nobel laureate, world-class expert of quantum science and technology. He's a world-renowned, remarkable mind, as well as very kind, humble, and inspirational, inspirational scientist from Oregon University of United States. Professor David Weinland has kindly agreed to join us, and he's going to give a great talk entitled as Atomic Clocks. So Professor David Weinland does not need any introduction at all. Nevertheless, I would like to make a brief introduction. Professor David Weinland is an American physicist who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2012 for groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. David Weinman began his NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology career with a bank when he became in 1978, one of the first scientists in the world to use laser lasers to cool gases of ions, atoms with an electric charge to very low temperatures. During the nearly four decades since, Weinland and his colleagues have gained even more control over the properties of individual ions by designing a number of ground, groundbreaking experiments and demonstrating many phenomena that were once in in the exotic realm of quantum theory. Professor David Weinland and the member of his laboratory used laser-cooled ions to build new ultra-precise atomic clocks, several of which have held in the world world record for accuracy. Professor David Weinland and his group members demonstrated important building blocks of quantum computers. The innovations from Weiland and his colleagues have many potential applications that go beyond atomic physics 
quantum computing and timekeeping, such as geological measurements, communications, and navigation. David Weinland received his BC degree from the University of California, Berkeley in 1965, and his PhD from Harvard University in 1970. Following a postdoctoral position, at the University of Washington in 1975, he joined the Time and Frequency Division of NIST. He holds a research associate position at NIST and joined professor position at the University of Colorado. Apart from the Nobel Prize, Professor David Weinland has received numerous awards that we are not able to list here. David Weinland is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Optical Society of America. He's a member of National Academy of Sciences of the United States. With this, I want to thank once again Professor David Weinland for joining us and invite him to, to begin his talk. David, we are very happy that you are with us. Good morning and welcome. Please begin your talk. Okay, well, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, let's see, now I can't see my presentation. <laughs> I can see, I can see you on full screen, but I lost my presentation here. So please again find share screen button. Okay, there we uh, go. Okay. Okay. You see, it works. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Uh, it's perfect. Okay. <laughs> well, and yes, uh, thanks again for the nice introduction and uh, it's a pleasure for, for me to, to be with you uh, today. So. Anyway, I just to uh, you know the title. Uh, I'm gonna just just to summarize what all the, the topics I'll cover is that basically what what our business has been is to try to make precise clocks, and we can ask why we need precise clocks. Uh, and then I'll give some basic ideas about uh, how atomic clocks work. And uh, in the last ten years or so, uh, we've moved to clocks that that tick, tick at optical frequencies. And I'll say a little bit about, about that, why it's interesting and how we do that. Uh, and then I'll conclude by uh, uh, giving you, you know, kind of a, a, an idea of where we're at and where the future might go. And I, I'm gonna, it, throughout the talk, I'll, I'll include a little bit of personal history. Actually, I, I started working on atomic clocks when I started graduate school in 1965. So basically, uh, you know, off and on, I've worked on now quantum computers too, but uh, basically throughout my whole career, I've worked on clocks. So let's say, let's ask what, why this first question, why, why precise clocks? And uh, for centuries, uh, you know, clocks were, have been used in navigation and that's, that's still true today. And so I'll say a little bit, of, I'll start by saying a little bit about that. So in, in traditional navigation, the, uh, you know, a person on the earth, say on a, on a, on a sailboat, he, he, would, uh, he would measure the, the, the or you know, find the sight along the direction towards say in the Northern hemisphere, for example, the North Star. And he would, and then he, he by measuring the angle between the, the, the direction of sight and the local level, uh, that uniquely determines the position, the north-south position, that is uh, the latitude position. So the idea for, for longitude, the, base, the idea is exactly the same. There's some fixed star. And the only difference, of course, is that the same method is used, but since the Earth is rotating, you have to know time to, to be able to interpret this angle you measure uh, at, to, to be able to get your east-west position, in other words, longitude. So just to give an idea of, uh, 
that how that goes. It, you know, a little simple calculation. If if we want to, if it, it, it, an error in our position given by uh, this this this angle error, it, it's basically that we, you know, it's the radius times the, the angle is this this error in position, and that's just you know, the radius times the frequency times the imprecision in time. So basically, uh, if we can, uh, it, it, it, for for example, the if we can hold if if our clocks are good enough to uh, our time is good enough to about one second, then that gives a imprecision in this in this position of about quarter of a nautical mile. And there's an interesting history about this. The in in the early 1700s. Uh, uh, uh, Britain had lot of, lost a lot of uh, ships due to the inability to accurately uh, find their position and longitude. And so there was a prize sponsored by the British Parliament of about 20,000 pounds, which is a huge amount of money in those days. And, uh, uh, and, the, and the prize was given if, if someone could make a clock that would, be, that would allow uh, uh, uh, navigational precision longitude to about 30 nautical miles. Uh, that then they would set and they would win the prize. And so, and that's made the timing then is, is basically the time to require to get 30 nautical miles precision. It's about two minutes. And uh, of course this had to be maintained over months, the times that the, the ship was at sea. And anyway, the, the, the, there's a famous story about John Harrison, a, a clockmaker in, in, in Britain that, that actually made, you know, Made the clocks that, that satisfied the conditions of this prize, and you know the it's an interesting historical note is that you know although he satisfied the prize, the, the Parliament kept stalling on giving him his award, and finally the king had to step in and and make sure that he, that he received the prize. Anyway, there's a nice book if you look up this person here, Davis Ovo, that there's a nice non-technical uh, uh, description of that story. Okay, well, the, these days, of course, we, uh, uh, you know, we were more used to navigating with with uh, satellites, and the idea there is is is pretty simple, and that is, uh, if we if we if say a person on the Earth has a clock, and there's a clock on on board a satellite, and if they if they're if they're synchronized, that is, if they tick at exactly the same rate, uh, then the the, the distance of the satellite is just given by the, the the speed of light times the delay time, the time from when it's emitted to when it reaches, uh, say, you on the Earth. And just to give an idea of the precision's there, if if the time is uncertain to about a nanosecond, then that gives an imprecision in the length uh, to the the distance of the satellite of about thirty centimeters. And there's also this this say you know. An error of one nanosecond over one day is about a part in ten to the fourteen, and this is also the, the, the, the it's a measure of the precision that the clock has to, the clock rate, in other words, the frequency has to be precise to this uh, fractionally to the same precision, a part in ten to the fourteen, to to satisfy the, these conditions here. Of course, the the you know the system is a bit more complicated than that. There's a there's a, a grid of network of satellites <coughs> and that the system is somewhat overdetermined so that satellites can determine their relative positions and also synchronize the clocks and then but the the, the fact that this is a 3d system then we can find our, our position uh, anywhere on earth by synchronizing to these satellite signals so what what, what about clocks and the, I, the idea is, is very simple there we have some uh, just and generally some periodic event generator and then a counter and that generates time and, and uh, sort of the traditional uh, event generators are, uh, for example, the rotation of the earth and pendulum clocks and actually pendulum clocks were, uh, you know, they were pursued up and th through, through the early part of the 20th century and they, they can actually be very precise but not, not as precise as the atomic clocks we can make. So the so the the idea of a atoms is clock, the, the you know the the oscillating uh, uh, electrons in an, in an atom 
uh, are very much like a pendulum clock. And of course, we tend to think about, you know, in quantum mechanics, we think tend to think about wave functions, and uh, that that we talk about if if a, if a, if a say an electric dipole is based on the oscillation of uh, frequency between two energy levels in an atom, uh, then we uh, the frequency that that that that provides this oscillation is given by the energy difference of these of these two levels divided by Planck's constant. And uh, of course, it, I mean, for the, we talk about wave functions, but they, they our class, uh, classical picture of the atom with the electrons orbiting around the nucleus is, is pretty good for the purpose of describing uh, how clocks work. In any case, uh, if, if we want one ask, one way we can make clocks is if we have an oscillating electric dipole uh, that, that radiates and we can pick up some of that radiation uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and make a clock. And so uh, some of the early devices were based were masers or lasers. And I think everybody knows what a laser is. A maser is maybe a bit historical now. M just stands for microwave light, or L stands for light, of course. And, but the idea is exactly the same. And in fact, the earliest, uh, devices generating or, or demonstrating laser principle were actually at microwave frequencies, masers. Uh, anyway, the, the idea then is this oscillating electron emits radiation and to generate time, then we just count cycles. That we pick up this radiation and, and, and, and count cycles of the radiation to generate time. So I, a little bit of my history is I started uh, graduate school in 1965 at Harvard and uh, my my uh, advisor was Norman Ramsey, who was a famous atomic physicist from the 20th century. And uh, uh, in fact, he at, at, when I joined the group, that's me ne next to the boss there. Uh, anyway, he he uh, he and his colleague Dan Kleppner, who later went to MIT, they had invented and, and demonstrated the hydrogen maser. And uh, so the the the hydrogen maser works on the so-called ground state hyperfine transition, which is at about, oops, sorry, about 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, anyway, this was, this was his group at that time. So uh, right away in 1965, I, I was already playing with Cox. In this case, the uh, uh, uh, uh, maser is based on hydrogen and and Norman, Norman wanted to have accurate measurements of all the three isotopes of hydrogen. So, so my project was to measure the hyperfine frequency of deuterium. And that's, I'm probably the only person in the world that has this number mem memorized. But anyway, it, it, you know, it, was, it wasn't much different than the hydrogen maser. In fact, the hydrogen maser was a little bit better for technical reasons. But uh, anyway, but it was a good training for me because it, it you know, taught me about how to control the, uh, uh, pay attention to the precise control of the environmental, anything that can perturb the frequency uh, of the atoms. And also we were creating long lived superposition states. And I should have, I may, I maybe should have mentioned when I was talking about uh, clocks here, we talked about transitions. And in fact, I won't talk about this today, but basically the, the, the, the, the energy levels that make, uh, Good clocks also make good quantum bits. And so uh, the, the, the work on the clocks led naturally into be, being able to play games with, uh, with uh, you know, quantum bits and quantum computing uh, uh, uh, ideas, but I, I won't be talking about that today. So uh, anyway, one uh, coming back to this picture here, the, uh, I, I mentioned that we could make a clock based on just by, by uh, uh, counting the cycles of radiation from these emissions. But there, there was a bit of a problem because the, the typically in both masers and lasers, the atoms are inside of a, of a cavity that collects the radiation and also helps build, the, the, you know, increase the radiation. And the problem is that, that, that the atoms in, in cavity are, are coupled together. They're, they're both coupled oscillators. And it's and it's it, it's it's it's just very difficult to make the cavity be the same frequency of the atom, so it doesn't we, we say pull the frequency of the of the uh, of the atom. So, but otherwise, it, you know, these would have been just fine. But we had this one technical problem. 
So today, what, the more common mode of operation for an atomic clock is we initial our, initialize our atoms in the lower energy level. And then we apply radiation for a certain amount of time. Uh, and, uh, and then we, uh, then we uh, after turning that radiation off, pardon me, then we measure the probability of the atom uh, being in the upper level. And the maximum prob uh, transition probability is get then given when the, the frequency of the radiation is equal to the energy difference divided by Planck's constant. So that's the basic idea there. And of course, it, because the atoms are not connected directly to the radiation source, we, have, we avoided this problem with the masers and the lasers. In any case, when this condition is met, we then just count uh, the cycles of the radiation source to generate time. So why atomic clocks? And uh, uh, if I, I'm gonna compare atoms to the pendulum clock and, or, and the same similar considerations go into say if this was a quartz crystal clock. And, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the, with the pendulum clock here. Uh, and th this is just expression for low amplitude oscillations uh, where G is the acceleration of gravity and L is the length of the pendulum. Uh, so what, what about environmental sensitivity? Well, one thing we have to worry about, of course, is temperature. Uh, and uh, of course, the, you know, most, most materials, the, the, you know, the, the material will typically expand, metals expand with increase in temperature. And so that, and if, so if the temperature rises by some amount that gives a increase in the length of the pendulum. And of course that, uh, that slows the clock down. And just to give it, you can do a simple calculation. Even if we take a, uh, a material that has very low uh, thermal expansion coefficient, most metals are about a hundred times larger than this, value here. Uh, but anyway, that gives then about almost a part in 10 to the eighth uh, frequency change per degree C. If we compare to atoms, uh, uh, it, we, we typically, I, I show a cartoon here, we, it, we, we, I show atoms inside of some container. And actually the first, a lot of the first atomic clocks, they use uh, alkali atoms inside of a glass cell. And for example, the, the hydrogen maser it used, a, uh, used a, a, a quartz cell that was coated with Teflon in the, in, inside. And the idea there was just so the atoms wouldn't stick and perturb their frequency due to the be, being stuck on the wall. Anyway, so, but, uh, but the more fundamental thing we have to worry about in, in, in, uh, in our atomic clocks is the fact that these atoms are moving, then we have to, we have to consider the time dilation, the relativistic time dilation that Einstein taught us about. And of course, the you know the, the, the amazing thing is it's not like a, a simple environmental effect that where the here the here the clock is actually slowing down. As far as the atoms concerned, they can be perfect. And what Einstein taught us, of course, is that uh, you know time moves at different rates in a, in frames that are moving relative to each other. And uh, so this this so-called relativistic time dilation, we can calculate it say for. Uh, a cesium atom, which has an atomic mass of <coughs> about 133, the, the frequency shift per degree C then is about a part in 10 to 15, so about seven orders of magnitude smaller than the, the pendulum clock. And this is one of the reasons we use atoms, because it's this reduced sense, temperature sensitivity. The other, the other issues are, of course, uh, uh, uh, are how reproducible can we make our clocks? And for mechanical devices, it depends on the manufacturing tolerances. And of course, for the pendulum clock, it also depends on the local value of gravity, which changes over the, over the surface of the Earth. And of course, there's some wear, the, the, the bearing that holds the, the, uh, the pendulum um, bob length is, is, can wear and increase the length and cause changes in temperature, due to, pardon me, frequency due to that. Well, the nice thing about atoms is that, you know, as far as we know, all atoms of a particular species are, are exactly identical. And, uh, also, and, and atoms don't wear out as long as we can keep them around. We can use the same atoms over and over again. So just to give a, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of history then. So uh, the, the, the, the, the, the, 
in the early in the mid fifties, rather the uh, uh, an atomic beam based on um, uh, uh, based on atoms of cesium uh, was made, and I won't describe that device. But basically, as the atoms ran down uh, the, the the the tube that that that created or that held this atomic beam, uh, they would be irradiated and we had ways to detect when the atoms would absorb the radiation. Anyway, but the, the, that, was the, that was the most accurate standard uh, in the mid fifties. And so the, uh, it was a, uh, by international agreement, the, the second was at that point defined as uh, so 9 billion and so many cycles of this cesium uh, hyperfine transition. And, and the, so this definition was uh, agreed on throughout the world in 1967. And, and actually it's still the definition of the second. We were now uh, re reaching a, a region where there may be better clocks, but at least at the moment, this is still the definition of the second. So the, what, what about uh, using optical clocks? And uh, the, the, the thing there is that the, uh, uh, uh it, it, the ideas are very much the same, but uh, for example, I, I show for a mercury ion uh, where this, this shows the atomic notation uh, uh, energy levels. And uh, that, that this transition has a frequency of a little over 10 to the 15 Hertz. And the reason that this high frequency is interesting is that basically we can just, when we, when we make our clock, we can, we can count in more and more cycles for any given unit of time and, and gain precision that way. So that's one of the main reasons for going to, to higher frequencies is just that we can divine, divide the second into finer and finer divisions. Now, and then of course, what we'd like to do is find a, a, a, a, an, a, an atom or an ion where this, the, the absorption range is very, very narrow, which to, in other words, to get good discrimination to tell uh, when we tune the our radiation source, uh, when we get when we get absorption, and so uh, and, and you know, uh, it turns out mercury is a pretty good uh, case where the upper the the upper level lifetime is about a tenth of a second, and that gives a then the, a line width of this absorption feature of about around one and a half hertz, and uh, so that was one of the main reasons for going to these narrow optical transitions is we get very good frequency discrimination. So uh, to be able to lock our radiation source to this absorption feature. So you might ask, well, are, are optical clocks a new idea? And, and the answer is no. And in fact, and this was an interesting little bit that uh, this person you know, uh, found and the, uh, the idea, this was a, a text written by uh, uh, uh, Lord Kelvin and his colleague Peter Tate, and they attributed the, the idea to to Maxwell. And uh, that you can read the the the, the, the, the excerpt of the, the text from this uh, from this article. And, and um, you know they, they they had the basic idea that basically you know you can use uh, natural uh, uh, there were natural standards like hydrogen and sodium. They were their example was they were thinking about sodium and they were saying they're at, you know that they had the right idea that they're all exactly identical uh, and so therefore you know they could make a good standard and uh, they were as I say they were talking about sodium oscillations here they, they, they say vibration but they meant was the optical uh, uh, the oscillations of the electrons um, anyway so and they you know they also said uh, in the latter part of this text, they say the vibration is known to be absolutely independent of the position of the universe. Well, that's not true. As I'll, oops, as I'll get into a little bit here, the, the, uh, you know, this is another effect due to Einstein, and so, but they can be excused because they didn't know about Einstein's theory of relativity when they, when they, uh, when they made this, generated this text here. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, uh, uh, you know. I, atomic ion traps and the, the, the two people that, that uh, kind of invented these devices are, are Hans Daimel, uh, who was at the University of Washington and Wolfgang Powell at, at Bonn University. And I won't say a lot about the, the, 
you know, the operation of the trap. It, the ideas are pretty simple, but it takes a little while to go through. But the, the, the, the basic features are we can apply uh, a combination of electric, uh, pardon me, static and oscillating electric potentials to some electrode structures. This is one example. And that creates a three-dimensional harmonic will that we can hold our, our atom, atom, or in this case, our ions uh, in one place. So that, and as I said, I don't have time to go through the derivation. The students wouldn't take them long to get it, but it takes a while to go through the, the description. But anyway, a good 2D analog is just a marble in a bowl. That, that, uh, we, we have this three-dimensional harmonic oscillator. So what I'm going to talk about is experiments that, the, that were done at the, at, the, uh, at NIST and the National Institute of Standards and Technology in, in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, with, where I went in 1975. And I, one of my first colleagues there was Jim Berquist, and he was really he he really led this project to make a, a, a, a, a an optical frequency standard <coughs> based on mercury. So again, for the for, for this particular mercury transition, we have the ground state and then an excited. This is a quadruple uh, uh, state where uh, the lifetime is about a tenth of a second, and that's what gives this narrow absorption feature. So anyway, the the idea is that we're gonna we're gonna make radiation near this transition frequency. It's in the ultraviolet, uh, and uh, here's uh, the simplest case we can think about is is just one ion in the trap. Uh, and and the, the radiation we, the, our part, the reason we actually use one ion is that if we had two ions in the trap, the, the electric fields from one ion on the other can perturb the frequency of, the, of this, uh, of this up, uh, the energy of this upper level. So uh, the simplest case is to have one ion in the trap. So it turns out with one ion though, the uh, we, in principle, we could detect the absorbed radiation, and this is how most spectroscopy is done, is that we might have a sample of many atoms, and then we shine a, a, a beam through the atoms, and when the, when, the trend, when the frequency is tuned to the transition, then we get absorption. But it's, it's very difficult to detect absorption of, uh, of just one atom. We actually did an experiment where we could do that, but it's, it's fairly uh, complicated to do that. In any case, so... Uh, we, we actually do, do use a different way to detect when the, when the atom absorb, the ion absorbs this clock radiation. And the thing that what we do is we employ a, another, an, a third uh, level in this, in this ion. And in this case, this, this upper P level, it has a very short lifetime. And so if, we, if the atom is in the ground state, uh, and we shine this, this laser near 194 nanometers on the atom, we can scatter uh, you know, a lot of photons up to 100 million per second. And if we just calculate, or pardon me, capture a few of those scattered photons, then we can tell when the atom is in this state. So the idea then is that the way we can uh, measure this transition, let's suppose we put the atom in the ground state and then we try to drive the clock transition if the frequency of the, of the radiation is, is not tuned with a transition frequency, then the atom remains in the ground state. And then when we turn on the second laser, we see lots of scattered photons. On the other hand, if the radiation that excites the transition was tuned properly to, to excite the atom to the upper level of the clock transition, then when we turn on the second laser, there, there's no scattering. And in fact, we can easily tell when that condition is, even if we capture just a small amount of light we can see in this graph here. We just, just as a demonstration, we left both lasers on, but when the atom was in the, uh, was in the, in the, <coughs> pardon me, in the ground state, it would scatter a lot of light. And when it was in the excited state, it scattered very little. You can actually see some, a little bit of uh, detection down here. And that's just due to scattered light, the, you know, stray scattered light in the experiment. So anyway, if we and clearly you can even see in this simple experiment, if we set a discriminator on our detector at about halfway between the no fluorescence and fluorescence, we can essentially tell with 100% efficiency when the when the atom makes the transition. Uh, so let's see. Pardon me. What was I going to say here? Uh, oh yeah. The, oh I, yeah. So we can actually make pictures of the atom. Uh, 
Now we can't see the, the atom, you know, the mercury ion because it's in the ultraviolet. Uh, so we can't see it with our naked eye, but this picture was made with a, a ultraviolet, uh, a, a, a, a, basically a, you know, a, a, a simple uh, a camera, that, a video camera that was sensitive to ultraviolet light. And so we can make this picture of the, of the of a single mercury ion inside the, the trap. You can see some scattered light from the from the trap electrodes here. Um, anyway, so the one interesting about the little side thing that's interesting about this picture, you see, this is the this is the image of your, of that mercury ion, uh, but it's actually uh, we we have other ways to measure the wave the size of the wave packet of mercury ion, and it's actually about. Uh, several about 500 times smaller than the image you see in this picture and that's just due to the the the the, the, the, the, the op limits of the optics that we use to to to observe the ion uh, the other nice the other thing that's interesting about this this detection transition is that we can also use this trend this transition for laser cooling and uh, in my in my introduction the introduction of my talk that this was mentioned and the idea is actually, I mean, the students would, maybe I won't quite get it across here in the short time, but the idea is very simple. And so if, if we shine this, this, this laser here at, at the atom, at, at the ion, and let's suppose the atom it, uh, is moving against the, the direction of the laser beam. If we tune the, the frequency of this laser beam slightly below the, the absorption frequency, then when the atom moves against the laser beam, uh, it, it the because of its movement, it Doppler shifts the apparent frequency of the laser up and into resonance. And so when it moves, the idea we we arrange the tuning so when the atom is moving against the laser beam, it it, it scatters more than when it moves away from the beam. The, when it's moving away, the Doppler shift even puts it farther out of resonance. And so this asymmetry, uh, we it, it, you know allows us the, the the radiation pressure from this. From when it's scattering the light works only when it when the atom is moving against the laser beam, and we can use this differential effect to cool the ions. And just to give you an idea, the uh, in this mercury experiment, the, we when we started the experiments, they were typically done at room temperature. About the apparatus was at room temperature, around 300 Kelvin, uh, and uh, and the atom would uh, uh, assume that temperature as well. But when in the, when we turned on this radiation pressure cooling, uh, we could reduce the, the ambient, uh, uh, the, the ions at the ambient temperature down to about a millikelvin, which would uh, suppress the, rate, the time deletion shift almost by a factor of a million. So this is a picture not long after uh, we had done those cooling experiments. This, uh, I, the, the, I had done those cooling experiments with my colleague, uh, Bob Drollinger, I didn't know anything about lasers when, when we started this experiment. So he taught me about lasers. And later we were joined by uh, Jim Burkwist, the fellow I, I mentioned who uh, was working uh, later on the mercury clock. And, and, and about the same time, Wayne Otano, who was uh, certainly the theoretical expert in, in our group in, in, in Colorado. Uh, anyway, I, I won't say all the, all the things we had to go through to, to, to make uh, I use our mercury ions as clocks, but just a couple of the features of the clocks. First of all, the trapping means uh, that um, the average velocity goes to zero, which means also the average first order Doppler shift goes to zero. So we just by the trapping we can we can average the uh, the, the the first order Doppler shift effect to, to zero. And then I mentioned how laser cooling can reduce the Einstein's uh, time dilation shift. Uh, in the later experiments, we we did the, we ran the vac the, the vacuum system uh, was at four kelvin, and the reason we did that is it, it first of all it suppresses uh, collisions of the ions with background gas. Uh, basically, almost all gas, except for some some helium, uh, is is frozen out on the on the on the electrode at these low te at, at liquid helium temperatures. There were some other reasons, and that is. Uh, that, for example, that you know, that I always found it interesting that you know the, what we call 
black body shifts, it's just the thermal radiation. And even in, in the room, as we, as we sit at our desk, the, the electric fields in the black body radiation are actually not small. They're about, they're about 10 volts per centimeter. Uh, but of course, we don't feel, feel that. But anyway, the, the, this thermal radiation can also shift the, the frequency of, the, of this transition. And so we, that's another reason to go very low temperature because this, the black body, so-called black body shift goes as temperature to the fourth power. So by going to, from 300 Kelvin to four Kelvin, we can highly suppress that effect. Anyway, I, as I said, there was a lot of details that have been gone through that, uh, in, this, in this Mercury project, but uh, what was nice in, in, in, uh, in around 2006 was that Jim Berkowitz and his colleagues got the, uh, made the, it was the first clock that had a, a, a systematic uncertainty that is uncertainty due to all the perturbation, environmental perturbations and so on, that was less than the, the cesium clock. And uh, so it, and it, it was, and the uncertainty at that time was just a little under part and 10 to the 16. And the part and 10 to the 16 is about where the, the best that the, the best cesium standards could be. Uh, anyway, that was explained in this first paper. Anyway, the, so I, I think, you know, this in, in some sense marked the, uh, you know, the time when people started really seriously thinking about optical frequency standards rather than uh, microwave frequency standards. So there's, there's many effects we have to worry about. And I list a few of the common ones we have to worry about. For example, magnetic fields, there's always stray magnetic fields, and those can shift the transition of uh, uh, the frequencies of our clock transitions. Actually, what we do to, to, to, to handle that is we measure other transitions in the, in the atoms or ions that are more, much more sensitive, sensitive to magnetic field. Uh, and so uh, we, by measuring those, we can calibrate the magnetic fields and then calculate how much it shifts the, the frequency of our clock transition. <clears throat> And uh, there's other interesting effects. As I say, the most interesting ones are due to relativity. I've already talked about the time dilation frequency shift uh, uh, due, due to Einstein. Uh, but Einstein also, in his theory of general relativity, he, he, he explained to us that the, there's also a second kind of time dilation shift. And, and that is that independent of the, of the atom's motion, uh, if, they, if they're in different gravitational potentials, they, they run at different, the, you know, the time runs at a different rate and we have to account for that. And just to give an idea for, on the, you know, the, the, the it's called a red shift because the, in a, a clock, you know, radiation uh, uh, runs at a, at a slower rate uh, and in a deeper gravitational potential. That's why we call it a red shift. In any case, on the surface of the earth, uh, uh, you know, this, this this gravity this redshift is about a part in ten to the eighth uh, from the gravitational potential of the Earth at the surface of the Earth. Uh, and uh, when we compare clocks, we have to worry about the the you know the change in this redshift due to changes <clears throat> in height. And so, just to give you an idea, it's it's a small effect, but. But, but we can measure it with our clocks. Anyway, just to give you an idea how small it is. So a little story is, suppose you had a twin sibling and you were separated at birth and uh, you, you live at sea level and your twin lives in Boulder, Colorado, about 1.6 kilometers above uh, sea levels. It turns out after 80 years, your, ten, your twin will only be about a millisecond older than, than you do to this effect. So it's a very small effect on a practical scale, but we have to worry about it in our clocks. So, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, what we did is just to demonstrate this, this effect in kind of a fun way as we, we, uh, we had a, a, a second clock. This one was, this was a later clock based on aluminum ions. Uh, also, in the, it was very similar to the Mercury, except it just had some different features that were nicer in the, the guys leading this project are Dave Leimbrandt and Dave Hume. I show on the right here. Um, anyway, the, uh, the one reason we chose this aluminum transition, I mentioned that in the, the upper state in the mercury, 
ion has a lifetime of about a tenth of a second, and that limits the resolution we can determine the transition with. This up, the upper lifetime, uh, the lifetime of the upper state in aluminum was about 20 seconds, about 200 times longer. That meant we get a, a, a, a 200 times more narrow absorption feature that allows us to better pin down the frequency. Anyway, for fun, we, uh, uh, we, we, we, had, we had two clocks. This doesn't look much like a clock, I should say. And, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that I haven't described. In this, this you can see this shiny uh, tube here, metal tube, it was aluminum. Uh, basically, inside that tube, it was in, in, under vacuum, and that's where our ion trap was located. And what you see around the table here is just uh, a lot of optics that guides the laser beams. The laser beams are over on this side of the table, and then there's a lot of optics that guides the laser beams into the into the vacuum system and through the, the trap. Anyway, so this was this this apparatus we were calling clock number one. And in, in an, a room next door, actually just to the right of the picture here, we had another clock, which was, you know, for all intents and purposes, was identical to this one. And, uh, and, and we had them the same physical configuration. So when we compared them, uh, uh, the, what, the clock two in the other room to clock one in this room, uh, we could measure the, the ratio of the frequencies of the two clocks. And we didn't go for the ultimate accuracy or this was maybe a little better than a, a you know, a, a part in 10 to 17 uh, and, and for the time we took to measure the transition. Uh, but anyway, just for fun, then we, you, you can, in this next picture, you'll see James Chow, one of the guys working on this experiment. You can see he's put a jacks under, the, under this table. And so what he, what he does here is he raises the clock number one up by about 33 centimeters. And then we measured the ratio again. And you can see, we see a, we see a non-negligible effect, about 40 parts, about 40 parts in 10 to the 18 shift due to raising this clock by, by, uh, uh, by um, just, pardon me, by, by just, just on the order of a foot. And, the, and since we've, We've raised the clock. This clock number one has less of a gravitational potential shift. Pardon me. And so the, fre the frequency speeds up, and we could measure that effect. Oops, sorry. I'll get synchronized here again. Okay, so I, you know, there's, I should say, you know, that, that this at NIST, this experiment on the Merc, uh, pardon me, on the aluminum clock continues, and there's many other. Ions that are interesting to make uh, optical clocks. There's also many neutral atoms that are are are, are being used. And the one nice thing there is that the, by having more uh, atoms or ions, the that the signal to noise in the experiment uh, increases with this with the with the square root of the number of atoms we we use in the experiment. So one nice thing about the the neutral atom experiments is they can use several thousand at a time. And so they can get to these high precisions more quickly than we can with our ions. Uh, in any case though, they, they, you know, they have to work, <coughs> they have to worry about this systematic, different kinds of systematic effects as well. But anyway, just to give an idea where we're at. Uh, so the clocks, you know, today are, uh, there's a number of clocks that have uncertainties expressed fractionally uh, of about a part in 10 to the 18. And that this paper is a little bit of, out of date now, but the reason I listed it is that uh, it, it's, it, you know, if you want to find out about these different clocks, it, it talks about almost all the other kinds of clocks that are being, uh, be, being made these days. Uh, so anyway, but anyway, and there's, you know, you, by going through the literature, you'll find updates on the, you know, the, on the exact numbers for these other clocks. But anyway, this is a good place to start. So what, what about the future? And well, one thing, you know, we, we now, it's pretty clear that, the, that the, the optical clocks are better than the cesium clocks. So the natural, you know, thing to think about is, well, why don't we redefine the, you know, the, change the definition of the second. And uh, the reason we're reluctant to do that is that even though the optical clocks are better, there's no 
clear winner, I would say. So if we choose one ion as a standard, maybe next year we'll have to change, change them uh, to a better one. Uh, and so I think there's reluctance to make the change too quickly. So right now the, the standard is still based on the cesium transition, which we can compare to the optical transitions. And I haven't got, you know, this is another whole lecture here to talk about uh, certain kinds of entangled states we make. Uh, here the measurement in the, in the for, for, you know, if we talk about the measurement in precision, uh, it basically scales as one over in the, you know, in the, in the regular clocks, it scales as one over the square root of the number. But if we use these special, so-called special entangled states, we can make that go down as with a number, uh, another factor of one over square root of n, which would be a huge gain when we're dealing with a large number of atoms. Okay, so the other thing is, you know, I mentioned navigation at the start, and uh, now we can, with the, the clocks we have, we can get down to about the one centimeter scale using the kind of, you know, the satellite, the, the ideas in the satellite navigation. Uh, we can also measure down to this one centimeter scale by measuring the this so-called gravitational redshift uh, that Einstein told us about. That's about a part in ten to the it's about a part in ten to the eighteenth per centimeter. Uh, so in any case, we we are looking towards doing navigation at this one centimeter scale. And uh, one one you know other than you know I don't you know it probably isn't going to whoops probably isn't going to help us to get to to the nearest store to buy what we need. But uh, we don't need we don't need to have it that accuracy, but that accurate. But one thing people are thinking about is you know maybe you could measure earth strains, and that's the, that's the situation where if you have two sites that are that are separated by a few kilometers, and if the if if the relative heights change, uh, that indicates strain on the surface of the Earth, and and uh, you know the people work working about studying earthquakes, they know that the that the strains are a precursor of of earthquakes, and so maybe that maybe maybe we could use that to maybe not predict uh, earthquakes, but, and, but at least we, we can use it to, to predict the, you know, the probability of an earthquake. And of course, there's always the, you know, we're always interested in the fundamental science. And one of the things we and other groups have pursued is if we make our clocks based on different atoms, the, the transitions tip, you know, will they always depend a little differently on the strength of the relative forces. The, the electromagnetic versus the strong, for example. And by measuring uh, different species and comparing them in time, we can have, we can, uh, we can, we can determine whether the base, the strengths of the basic forces are, are relatively changing in time. So we, in that, a number of experiments have done, done, we haven't found anything yet. The fear site to think about, I've come up with theories how they might change in time. But anyway, that hasn't been detected yet. But we can also think about, uh, you know, it turns out that you know, dark matter. A lot of the models for dark matter are like just like a, an electric field or magnetic field that passes over the atoms. And if we have a, a, a clock separated by large distance, we could maybe detect this dark matter. And similarly, uh, for uh, for for gravity wave detection, if we have sep clocks separated by large distance, we could we could we could detect we could tell their relative separation and by accurate clock measurements. Oops, no oh boy, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and potentially measure gravity waves. So, so there's some, and we're always interested in finding deviations from Einstein's theory of relativity. No, that hasn't happened yet, but, but it's still a, a fun thing to think about. So that, that, that's it. I just wanted to say, uh, kind of state the obvious here that I showed our group in, in 19, uh, you know, around 1978, and uh, it was just four of us. But the group gradually grew over the years. In, in, uh, in 2018, we're up, we're up to close to 30 people. And so, so you know, it wasn't me and just a couple of other guys working on this over the years. Many people, mostly students and postdocs and visitors that, that came to the group. But you can see it's very fairly large effort and, uh, I, uh, and, and there's many labs around the world like 
uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology that are doing similar work. So it's a, it's a big enterprise uh, globally as well. I show some of our sponsors. We, we although NIST supported our work, we we we you know we to really you know make things progress as quickly as we wanted. We we had other outside agencies that also supported this this work. Uh, and I also want to say is that the, the working at NIST, the uh, National Institute of Standards, was really it was really a nice experience. I, I mean, I I always wanted to go into academia when I was you know going through my postdoc and so on. But uh, and and I, I I had a couple of offers, but at places that that went couldn't offer you know support research uh, very strongly. But when I came to NIST, uh, you know our, our our leaders were very, you know, forward thinking, and they they supported our work very well. So, so we can make a lot of progress. And, and I, I feature two people here. Catherine Gibby was our our our, uh, our leader for for many years, and more recently, Carl Williams uh, took over the leadership of the of the standards work. <clears throat> so, I just uh, I, I maybe just for the students, it's always fun to maybe give a little bit of an idea, of, you know, how how things work for me, and uh, so just just just very briefly, my my parents, you know, lived through the Great Depression in the in the U.S. for ten years to, from from 1930 to 1940, and they were lucky that they had they both had college degrees and they they had jobs through the Depression, and a lot of people didn't have jobs so anyway, because of the the worry about situations like that my, they, my, certainly my parents has a big emphasis on, on me going to college to find a good job so you know the one rule was you know keep my grades up in school and, and also my father was you know he was a civil engineer but you know he would play mathematical games with me which kind of encouraged my interest in that direction but my uh, in, in spite of this emphasis on you know doing well in school my, my parents were very uh, supportive of, of doing other stuff. And so as a young kid, I played with model airplanes. And then uh, and, and then later when I got, you know, got to be high school age, my friends and I were all crazy about cars. And so uh, I, and, and I actually got a, I, I got a, I got my first car at age 14. I couldn't drive it until I was age 16. But my father brought it home and I worked on it for two years to tear it down and fix it up, do things like that. So, so I'd, I'd say, you know, that uh, this experience with cars was not, not wasted because it helped me later. And, and even later in high school, my friends and I were, you know, modifying cars and this experience, you might say, well, it's a, kind of a waste of time, but actually this, this working together with people is very much like working in a physics lab in, the, in, in, in experiments, you're typically working with several people. So this early experiments of working in cars was, was very, really very much like that. So just to give me a little, uh, an idea of my, my background, I, after high school, I went, my first, I went to the University of California. And I first went the first two years to the Davis campus and which was close to where I lived and where I grew up. And uh, it was primarily, uh, an ad, had been an agricultural agricultural school in fact it still it still is one of the top agricultural schools but of course you know big time physics was down at berkeley uh, near san francisco and so it turns out within the university of california system it was it was trivial to change uh, schools all i had to do was fill out a form and, and so i've transferred to berkeley to be where the physics program was was uh, stronger um, and then I, after graduate school, I went to, to Harvard University. I showed you a little bit about that. And then actually went to did a, a postdoc with Hans Stamot, the first person I showed who was uh, uh, uh, one of the inventors of the entrance. In fact, I should have mentioned they shared the Nobel Prize with, uh, that is uh, Hans Stamot and Wolfgang Powell, the inventors of the entrance. They, they shared the Nobel Prize with Norman Ramsey, my thesis advisor, uh, uh, and his his part of the prize was for the the, uh, the Mazers and atomic beam methods. 
anyway, uh, so uh, I want to thanks thank thanks everybody for listening, and of course, good luck to the to the students that are, have listened here. Good luck to you and your careers. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for this very exciting, interesting, and comprehensive talk. So please ask questions, send in, ask them through chat button of the Zoom platform. And we have also received some questions. Dave, may I ask you these questions? Indeed, some of them you explained very nicely. But uh, nevertheless, maybe a little bit modifying. I have to modify it because you uh, explained indeed these questions. As we know, the first question is, as we know, gravity affects everything as it is the dynamics of space, uh, space time itself according to general relativity. How do you manage to take into account the effects of general relativity as well as special relativity? For instance, time dilation effects in building yeah, atomic clocks. You explained these things, but is there any room in, in this context for improvement the pre uh, uh, ultra precise atomic clocks for improvement? Well, I mean, I, I, I've explained that, you know, it, about the gravitational potential redshift, for example, that's an effect we have to to, to take account of, um, I'm, I'm not, you know, so, you know, I don't know whether that can improve it. In fact, it's an effect we have to, we have to kind of, you know, compensate for. Um, actually, what I always, you know, just a, a little side note is that I, I just for fun, once I looked at, you know, the, the, there's a giant super cluster of galaxies, the, the, the Virgo super cluster, and it's about 20, I forget, about 50 light years away. But there's so much mass in it that the, the gravitational potential redshift uh, for clocks on the Earth is about 5,000 times larger than the shift due to the Earth itself for clocks on the Earth. So anyway, so it's, you know, it just pervades the universe. So we have, uh, I, I would say, I don't know whether, you know, we, we it's an effect, rather than improving a clock's an effect, we have to take uh, you know, we have to take <coughs> account of, particularly when you think about, inter, you know, interstellar travel, then, you know, you have the, the shifts are even bigger to, between, you know, distant clocks. So it's, it's an interesting effect. You know, on the near the surface of the Earth, for example, the, the satellites around the Earth, they're, they, they're you know, the, the Virgo cluster is so far away. That the shift is about the same for all the clocks near the Earth. And so that problem, they just, you know, that, problem kind of drops out of the picture. But if for interstellar travel, you know, I mean, it start, it's, it's an interesting issue that people eventually will probably have to think about. So I'm sorry, I wasn't answering your question. I don't know, as I say, I don't know whether <coughs> knowing gravitational, uh, you know, the general relativity better, uh, I think we know it well enough to be able to predict the shifts. It's just that we have to account for them. So. So thank you, thank you so much. The next question is, uh, what do you see as the main challenges to the present and future of atomic clocks? In, well, in the sense of say accuracy, size and weight. Okay, well, I think that, yeah, I mean, they're, they're certainly becoming, you know, the, they're becoming more compact in these, Experiments I, I described, they now, you know, they, they now literally fit inside packages, maybe the size of a, a shoebox, and they can be moved around. And the reason that's interesting is, is to is to be able to again for to be able to do navigation. You know that we can do navigation much more precisely. So, um, I mean, there, there's certainly that development goes on this, you know, making them much more compact, and we can always find. You know ways to make and you know for our top optical clocks we can find ways to make our lasers better and so that that certainly can, you know continues. One one sort of ultimate question is you know often 
get asked, you know, is there any limits to the precision of clocks? And the answer is no. That, that you know, we have, you know, we have to worry about the signal to noise. So we want lots of atoms, but, and we have to worry about all these environment, you know, these perturbations, you know, the red time dilation and so on. But there's, in principle, there's no limit to how, how well we can do. So it's, you know, it's, um, it helps us keep our job. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, the Heisenberg quantum mechanical uncertainty does affect the uh, accuracy of, or the limit of accuracy of atomic clocks. But the question is, is, is there uh, some way uh, to, to somehow bypass uh, the obstacle formed by, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to improve the accuracy? Well, we, uh, the answer is no, we have to take it into account. Uh, but I did, I did mention, and again, I, you know, it's a, another whole subject, which is interesting by itself. But I mentioned that, you know, when I talked about the future, I talked about using entangled states. And mm -hmm. these particular entangled states, we, we still have to, we have to obey Heisenberg. But, the, you know, we can arrange these, these, uh, these entangled states such that they, they, they, the uncertainty in the measurements, again, limited by Heisenberg, are reduced uh, compared to the case where the atoms aren't entangled. So we, we always have to keep Heisenberg in mind, but we have ways to, to reduce the, you know, the effects. And, and entanglement is one way we can do that. Thank you. There's another question which states that uh, what can you say about uh, the uh, about the comparison of uh, ordinary atomic microwave, microwave or optical clocks with the nuclear atomic clocks? Perhaps, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should have I I, I I should have mentioned that. Yeah, this so that uh, you, you sounds like you you know that uh, in the last several years people. Uh, that, and there's, a, there's an example that, that gives an idea of what people are thinking about, and that is in uh, thorium-229, there's a nuclear transition which is actually at an optical frequency. So it's, you know, the, in general, the nuclear levels are separated by much higher energies, but there's in, in thorium-229, there's two level, nuclear levels that are close, relatively speaking, close together, separated by a transition wavelength of 150 nanometers, roughly. And so people, you know, a number of clock people are, are thinking about trying to use that transition. One, one, bit, one attraction is, I mean, it's just, it's sort of exotic as why people are interested in it. But the, but the other reason is that one reason, the fundamental reason that it, it might be better is that basically the, this, you know, it, it's based on this nuclear transition and the uh, electron cloud in the atom around the around the nucleus tends to shield the nucleus to a very high degree from external electric and magnetic fields for example so so that's one of the big attractions to to this nuclear transition and, and as i say i think you know it's it's a very hard experiment the wavelength is very short but i am sure people will, will eventually do it and, and it'll be be really interesting to see how that progresses and yeah so anyway Okay. There's not just atomic transitions. Yeah. So indeed, th th this question somehow also repeats the same. In a sense, there's some intersection, I think. Are there any preferred choices of elements, transitions for building atomic clocks? So oh. elaborate a lot about the mercury atom is this a preferred yeah. choice or there are another choices as well? No, there, there are certainly other choices. And I would say that, you know, they all have advantages and disadvantages. And, and for example, that's why I mentioned it, you know, with now that the optical clocks are, are better than cesium in terms of accuracy, you know, you, you, you know, it's natural to want to change the definition of the second, but there, but there's, there's a number of optical clocks that are very good in, in, and we don't know which one the best one is yet. So I think, uh, you know, that's still, the, it'll, it'll continue to evolve, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, but, 
but that's why I said, you know, maybe we don't want to jump to changing the definition of the second because it's, if there's a better optical clock, you know, certainly there are optical clocks better than the cesium clock now, but the, but if we change the definition, maybe next year there'll be a better optical clock. You know, you don't want to have to keep doing that, making the changes. So, and anyway, that, but, but, but, you know, I, I think there's just, you know, again, I'll just come back and say that, you know, it's no, there's no limit on how well in principle we can do. So. Yes, thank you. So uh, you also uh, explained nicely this, uh, this questions indeed in your talk, but nevertheless, maybe again, in, in the sense of a, a room for imp improvement, improvement. What is your forecast for the role of atomic clocks in the next decades, for instance, in the framework of prediction of earthquakes or for discovering new physics, which is now, in a sense, very active, actively discussed, new physics beyond standard model and so on. So. Well, I, I mean, I was specula speculating there, of course. I mean, we, we, you know, even for the application of, of, of detecting earth strains, you know, I think that's well-founded, but it's a, it's a hard technical problem. But hopefully, you know, maybe it will have that application to being able to help predict uh, earthquakes. And as far as, you know, finding new physics, I think, you know, I mean, there are, I, I mentioned, for example, you know, uh, dark, detecting dark matter and, and there, you know, there's many theorists who like to come up with ideas the way, the way you know, it could shift things and, and so on. So there, there's theories out there that can always be tested. And so I think, you know, as experimentalists, we're always, eager to, to check those things whenever, you know, new ideas come yes. up. So. Sure. S thank you. So, uh, there are another two questions. Can I ask two more questions? Sure. So, what can you say about the general notion of time from the physical point of view, but, but not philosophical, in the context of atomic clocks? Do you have a particular notion of time based on the conception of atomic clocks? Uh, I'm, maybe, maybe I'm not sure exactly what you're asking there. Maybe, maybe just rephrase it a little bit. I'm not sure what you what you were asking there. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of discussion about the notion of time, basically philosophically, or is a... a, a is a time emergent notion or it is a, a standard notion and so on, so on. So atomic clocks indeed say something about this. So somebody asked these questions. So general yeah, notion I, of time. I, I, again, I'm not, maybe, maybe I won't be. General physical notion of time. Uh, is it change with the uh, development of Atomic clocks, for example. I see. No, I wouldn't. I, at least in my own view, I would say no. I mean, I think, you know, I think physicists think about time, uh, you know, you know, in the same way as a non-specialist thinks. You know, a non-scientist thinks about time. It's just a, it's a way to to order events, and I, I think our our and and there, you know, we can do it quantitatively by talking about time to this ordering process, but I would say, uh, at least in my own view, maybe uh, there's some other physicists that might have more profound statements to make, but to me, I, I think my notion of time is not any different than, uh, you know, <laughs> than the, you know, the guy at the grocery store, you know, he, you know, I, I think we, we think about time in the same way. Uh how your research on quantum computers on trapped ions and teleportation of information was related to your achievements in the development of atomic clocks. As, as you mentioned in your talk, uh, it is somewhat related in your, in your life and research. Well, I, I think, I think the, main, the main thing is that, you know, again, I, you know, I, I have a talk on 
quantum computers too. It's but that that you know would be fun to give. But I think that the uh, I think the main thing to say is that it turned out that the um, you know the apparatus we use for our atomic clocks is is basic you know largely the same as the as the apparatus we use to make, do our experiments on you know uh, uh, demonstrating the ideas of quantum computing. Uh, so and for example we uh, you know a good a good you know a nice you know fortuitous serendipitous thing that happened for us is that in in 19, in 1994, uh, my close colleague Chris Monroe is his name. He's now a, he's got his own uh, university position and has a company making quantum computers. But anyway, we in 1994 we we we were trying to make these entangled states that I mentioned, you know, for clocks. And uh, the methods we had in mind, uh, you know, well, wait, anyway, we had some methods in mind and. In, in, in 1995, what happened in this business of quantum computing was actually 1994, a, a, a, a, a, a theoretical uh, computational physicist, his name is Peter Shore, mathematician. He came up with an algorithm that said, if you could <coughs> efficiently, uh, if you could make a quantum computer, you could efficiently factorize large numbers. And this sounds like, you know, most people I sound like pretty esoteric math problem, but I think most, most, most people out there know that in fact, the, in, in our encryption systems, most of the encryption systems derive their security from the inability to, to efficiently factorize large numbers. I mean, a common one is RSA, you have to, you know, the initials after the three people invented it. And, and that would be compromised if we could make a quantum computer, that is, they could be decrypted and so, you know, you can imagine, so and he came up with this, this algorithm, Peter Shore is his name, came up with this algorithm in, in late 94. And of course, you know, many governments, including the one in the US, I mean, this, they had to be in this business because of the importance for, you know, encryption and decryption. And so uh, that really marked the a huge increase in the in the in the funding for the, you know, this this idea, and and I was going to come back to this story. One you know it was a nice, what was nice for us. We were trying. <coughs> my colleague Chris Monroe and I were trying to make entangled states for clocks, but it turned out the methods we were starting to implement were exactly what we need to make logic gates in, in our ions. So we could, in fact, we you know <laughs> there was a conference in in Boulder. It was it was uh, in in late, late uh, fall one year and, uh, you know, two of our fierce colleagues were there and we had, a, we brought in a guy, uh, Arthur Eckert is his name, he's a well-known theorist in, in quantum information. He gave us a talk on how this factoring algorithm would, would work. Anyway, these two theorists, friends of ours, they immediately jumped on this idea and they, you know, within, within, within about two weeks, they, they came up with a scheme how this could be done with ion traps. And, so they sent us a copy, a preprint of their paper, and it was so close to what we were, we were, you know, being able to do that we could, we could, you know, realize their basic, basic idea of their quantum gates within a, about six weeks. And so that was, that was a big thrill. Dave, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, final, very short question. Some people from our Meteorology Institute here is interested in your personal opinion. Uh, about the redefinition of second, whether uh, from your point of view, view it based on optical transitions uh, or based on the use of universal physical constant, which is going to be uh, to be redefined in 2026 yeah. or 2030. Your personal well, opinion about, about well, I, think, I mean, certainly the you know the you know, the values of the fundamental constants are an integral part about how we talk about atomic transitions and things like that. But um, I would say, you know, that, that I mean, for, to, to, to, pardon me, to generate time, you know, you need some device that will do that. And I, you know, I described some of the methods we've, 
you know, our group has explored. Uh, so, but I think, you know, I, I think it, it comes to, you know, these more practical issues. You can, you know, make better clocks if you can better control the, you know, these systematic frequency shifts. And so, you know, from, from our view, I mean, that, that, you know, read, you know, kind of make all the fundamental constants work together is, is a real interesting subject in terms of making better clocks. You know, I think that, we, you know, we view that as more of an engineering project. <laughs> Whatever the constants turn out to be, you know, it doesn't matter for what, how we would make our clocks, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Will you please give your final remarks or message to young people uh, which, which want to be a physicist or future physicist? Well, I, I mean, I, I think I would give an e even more, maybe more general advice, and that is that, you know, the students. Uh, you know, you know, even those that are, aren't interested in physics, I think it's important to, to, to find a subject, find something that's interesting to you, because, you know, if you're just out to, you know, find a job and make some money, you won't, you know, I don't think you'll be very satisfied with your job in general. So I think if, the main event, the main, you know, bit of advice I might make is just that, you know, I think the students should find something they're really interested, even if they change their mind, but find something, you know, they're, you're interested in and go for it, you know, don't hold back. Cause if you like it, you, you know, it, it, it, it, it, it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward and easy. In fact, I, you know, I often tell students, I mean, I view it, you know, more like a hobby, you know, it's just something I'm really interested in. And like cars and was, you know, for me in high school, you know, it's just, it's something I really liked. And, and, and, you know, so it was easy to, easy to push, push to do better. So. I, I saw, I watched your uh, uh, talk on video and have a read. You say that uh, uh, I, I was trying to insist students that I am not special. Uh, perhaps in this sense, if you are special, so, uh, <laughs> I don't know about indeed, that. Is this uh, <laughs> your answer? Remind me, indeed, is this your statements as well? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all you have done today for us and jo joining us. We, we, oh, we look very forward to see you in person after, uh, after COVID ends <laughs> in our institute here in Turkey. Oh, that would be that would be a very nice, great experience for me. And so, anyway, yeah, you're certainly welcome, and I was happy to do this. And... Thank you very much. Okay. So we can stop here, yeah, if you don't. Okay.